Welcome back. As you know, I am Eli the Computer Guy, and this is Silicon Dojo. Silicon Dojo is a thoriless, gatekeeperless, free to the end user, hands on technology education here in Asheville, North Carolina, that empowers our students to do whatever the hell it is that they want to do. Now, I will remind you that free to the end user is not actually free, right? Our classroom costs money to rent every month, uh, computers cost money. Big screens cost money. Lots and lots and lots of stuff cost money. So if you want to support what we're doing here, we do work for tips. There's a link down in the description for DonorBox. If you could click on that link and throw in a few dollars a month and to support this project that we're trying to do, that would be awesome. So the seminar that we're going to be doing today is the Chat GPT API. So I did this seminar here in Asheville, North Carolina a couple of days ago. And as things go, uh, OpenAI uh, came out with their Chat GPT 4 API literally two, two hours, two hours before I did this particular seminar. So if you're about to watch this and you're wondering about the Chat GPT 4, API, uh, all I've got to say is, yeah, I don't really know how the API works because one of the important things to understand is that for most people, we do not currently have access to it. So the ChatGPT4 API came out. Now, large enterprises, large organizations, they may have access to that API, but most of us, we are on a wait list and we may be on a wait list, frankly, for quite a while. So when we do, we're talking about the ChatGPT API today, I'm going to be showing you how to use the DaVinci model, so ChatGPT 3.0. I'm going to be showing you how to use the 3.5 model. That's the one everybody has been using for the past couple of months. I'm also going to be showing you how to use Dolly. That's the image creation model that they have. And I will be showing you how to use Whisper. And Whisper is the, the audio uh, tool where basically you can upload an audio file and turn it into text. Now, I know you may be sitting there and be, be thinking, well, but Eli, but Eli, if you're not going to be teaching and chat GPT 4.0. Why, why should I watch this video when it's already obsolete? The reason that would be good to watch this particular seminar is because the old models don't actually go away. One of the interesting things that I'll show you in this seminar is that the answers given by the Da Vinci model and the answers given by the 3.5 model are actually very different. And there's reasons why you might want to use an older model uh, versus a newer model when you're trying to create your particular project, right? So all the models that have been created, they're good at doing specific things. They actually have a way of speaking. Again, one of the things that I'll show you, a way of speaking uh, that may be important for you when you try to parse the text coming back, right? So again, when we talk about an API, it's important to understand you're actually going to be creating a program. That programming is going to be sending a request to ChatGPT, the ChatGPT is then going to send back a response. And then that text response that you get, you are going to have to parse and format into something that the end user is going to care about. Um, one of the things that you'll see is with uh, the, the turbo model, the 3.5 turbo model is it's a little bit more verbose and kind of weird. I hate to say politically correct ways. <laughs> It's kind of like the AI is trying to be politically correct and it doesn't really understand how to do it. So you just get like lots of sentences that are basically worthless. But basically what ChatGPT is, is doing is it's like, don't blame me, I'm just an AI. And why that's important, it's a little bit funny to, when, you, when you actually take a look at it, but why that might be important to you is if you're trying to parse that response, um, the 3.0 model doesn't have all that weird politically correct AI crap. And so it actually can be a lot easier for giving a cleaner response to give to your end user uh, versus the 3.5 model has all these disclaimers attached to it. And then for you as a coder, you're gonna have to remove all those disclaimers. And so it might be easier to use an older model. And so that's the thing, like when uh, ChatGPT 4.0 comes out, when you're actually able to use it, one, it's actually going to cost more money to use because it's a more powerful uh, model. So it may not matter for whatever it is that you're trying to do. And also, its manner of speaking uh, might be such that you realize that it's actually easier to parse the responses from older models. So that's, that's just something to, to keep in mind uh, with this particular seminar. 
Okay, so I'm, I'm going to tell you a secret. I'm going to tell you a secret. And to be honest, this might get my geek card taken away. So, so take this to heart. One of the ways that technology professionals like me continue to get paid a lot of money, many times for doing slightly stupid tasks, is because average people, users, think what we do is much more complicated than it actually is. And so they go, I could never do that. Here, take a lot of money and solve my problem, right? This is important. We start talking about things like artificial intelligence because there's a lot of people out there and they're like, Eli, Eli, I could never do artificial intelligence. I'm not good at math. I don't understand statistics. You know, all that fancy coding. I just can't get it through my head. Eli, I'm going to leave AI to other people. Well, here's the thing. I'm going to tell, tell you a secret. I'm not actually that great with math. Um, I did take a statistics course in college. I will say I passed it. I think I passed it with a C. But here's the deal. It doesn't actually matter, right? We're not really dealing with AI. We're not really dealing with artificial intelligence. We're dealing with an API. APIs are not AI. APIs give us access to AI. And what this means is basically we can write 10 lines of code in Python and get all the power of AI while having no clue how we actually get the response. That's the amazing thing with the modern world. It's something we call serverless architecture. The modern architecture system is great. Basically, you write a few lines in Python, you then make a request up to a server. The server does something fancy. Don't get me wrong, the OpenAI people, the people that created OpenAI, they are smart, they have worked hard, they're brilliant. And what we're doing is we're just connecting to their infrastructure and simply getting a request back. And so all of this is a lot easier than you probably will realize. All we're doing, really all we're doing is we're figuring out a query to send up to chat GPT, like what's the best query we can send, basically what's the best question. We're sending that up, then we're literally getting a response. We are getting a text response, ASCII text response, and then we simply have to parse ASCII text. Right, that's not hard. A nine-year-old can parse ASCII text. So just kind of keep that in mind when we're dealing with these types of systems, um, is even though artificial intelligence itself, yes, that is a very complicated uh, field of study, what we're going to be dealing with, dealing with, AP, uh, with, uh, with AI through APIs, as you'll see is many times, it's somewhere between four to 10 lines of code. And I swear to you, you will be able to follow along. So here's the point in the seminar where I have to say, warning, Will Robinson, warning. This is where I have to pretend to be a professional for a couple of minutes and talk about the things that professional technology professionals should really focus on, right? Uh, one of the big issues we have in the tech industry right now is, you know, tech professionals, they want to focus on APIs and they want to focus on databases and blockchain and all kinds of stuff like that. And they don't want to focus on laws and regulations and maintenance contracts and licenses and that type of thing. And what I'll tell you is when you become a real technology professional, you know, sometimes most of your day is wrapped up in figuring out licensing schemes and that type of deal, uh, and very little of it might actually be writing code. This is a big thing to think about. Why this is important when we start dealing with artificial intelligence is because in the United States, with our legal system, our legal system grants copyright protection to humans, right? So copyright protection, if you draw a picture, if you write a script or a book, right? You basically have a monopolistic uh, ownership of that material unless you sell it or license it to somebody else. The human, the human that created the material gets a copyright. The human. If an AI creates the material, the AI does not, there is no copyright. It's not only that AI doesn't get the copyright, nobody gets the copyright. So I think about this with, um, uh, there was the monkey picture. Have you seen the monkey selfie picture? One of the cutest pictures you're ever gonna see, right? So there was like, there was a photographer, 
flew off to Australia or Bali or somewhere. Anyways, had his camera, had his camera sitting on the ground, and a monkey came up, literally picked up the camera, flipped it around, and the, the monkey did a selfie of itself. And the amazing thing was, it was an amazing selfie because it was right in the monkey's face. The monkey was a beautiful monkey. The monkey was having a fun time. It was one of the greatest pictures to ever be taken, right? So anyways, so the photographer who owned the camera and had done everything up until the point that the monkey had picked up the camera in order to make this happen, basically took that picture and then started licensing it out, right, for posters and mugs and all that kind of stuff. Well, somebody actually took that person, that, that photographer to court to say that they did not have a copyright because the monkey took the picture. So even though the photographer had to go there, even though it was the photographer's camera, even though, even though the photographer had to take it and actually sell it to the world, because the monkey took the picture, there was no copyright. A monkey is not able to have a copyright, and since the human did not take the picture, therefore a copyright did not exist. Um, there was a, there's currently a court case that just went through, and there was a comic book that was created, and it came from the court, it came from the judge, that the script for the comic book is copyrightable, but because they used an AI graphics generator in order to create the pictures for the comic book, uh, those pictures are not copyrightable. So this is an important thing to think about because a lot of folks, you know, when you're thinking about creating material, blog posts or whatever else, a lot of folks, right, they're thinking, well, if I can get a blog post, you know, created for two cents or something, that's worth it. But realize you're not going to own the copyright on it. So if you do anything creative, right, and you create, again, something like a comic book or something like that, you will not own the copyright on that material. So if anybody else in the world wants to copy what you're doing and slap it on t-shirts or coffee mugs or whatever else, they will be able to do that. One of the things in the content world is that many times the merchandise, uh, the amount of money people can make from merchandise is actually more than the original product that they created. So imagine if you use AI to create a comic book character or AI to create a book and it creates some kind of amazing character for the book. If you publish that, you don't actually own that character. You don't actually own that material. Somebody can literally copy and pay everything that you published from the AI somewhere else and you have no legal recourse. So be very careful about this. I can see this being a very big problem, um, let's say with startup companies. So imagine you have a startup company, you don't want to pay a graphic artist $100 or $150 an hour to create buttons, right? So you have your little iPhone app or whatever else. You know, you need graphics, you need buttons, you need logos, you know, you need all that stupid stuff. Imagine if you use AI basically to create the entire look and feel of your app and you do not own the copyright to it. You, you think piracy is bad now. You think copycats are bad now. Imagine when, when people are copy, truly copying what you're doing, copying and pasting what you're doing, and you can't even pretend to have legal recourse against them. This is something that you really have to think about. Paying a graphic designer $150 an hour may actually make a hell of a lot more sense than having Dolly come up with something for two cents if at the end of the day you can out and out own the copyright for the material that's created. So just kind of keep this in mind. As far as Dolly and uh, most of the stuff that comes out of ChatGPT is concerned, uh, you, you, can, uh, you can create the images, uh, you have the right to reprint them, sell them, put them on merchandise, the whole nine yards. So if you do create something with Dolly or whatever else, you have the right to put it on merchandise. Just realize somebody can take a picture of it, put it on their merchandise, and, uh, and make money off of what you feel like you created. This is something to keep in mind. So now let's talk about tokens. So tokens are the currency of the chat GPT world. And you're sitting here and you're like, well, wait a minute. Why do we need a currency for the, the chat GPT world? Why don't we use just normal currency, dollars or euros or whatever else? The reason is, is because that would make too much sense. Remember, the modern world of the technology business is to confuse the customer to such a degree that they're not even sure what they're buying anymore. And I really do bring that up with this whole thing with tokens, because tokens are weird. So a token 
as far as documentation is concerned, might be four characters, A, B, C, D. It might be four characters. I looked at the documentation trying to figure out what a token, actually the value of a token within the system, and it may be four characters, or it may be three characters, or maybe two characters, or maybe a couple of words. It kind of depends on how the AI breaks down the token count. It doesn't really matter. Uh, tokens are incredibly inexpensive. It costs you uh, uh, a fifth of a cent for a thousand tokens. But again, remember in the enterprise world, in the production world, where you're just, you're just churning through and, and basically hammering the hell out of the API, uh, understanding that the pricing model is a bit wonky, you know, that, that, might, that might help you out for making sure you don't go bankrupt from using this API. Uh, the other thing uh, with the tokens, just to keep in mind, is that tokens are used both for the query and for the response, right? So many times, whenever we use APIs, uh, we think that we're only going to get charged for the response. So like send an SMS message, send an email. So we know we're gonna get charged for that email sent, we know we're gonna get charged for that SMS sent. The important thing to understand with ChatGPT is you get charged for the query in tokens and the response. So if you say, please tell me a story about unicorns and clowns, that query will cost you tokens. And then the response, one day a clown ran into a unicorn, blase, 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 that will cost you tokens. And then there's a total token cost uh, that you'll be given when you get the response back from chat GPT. So this is just an important thing to be thinking about. This gets uh, even more significant with the chat GPT-4 model. Again, even though we're not really getting into it, uh, because with chat GPT-4, you can actually give uh, 8,000 coins um, per, per query. So you can put up the 16 pages of information into the query uh, and then ask for a very simple answer. So most of the cost may actually come from the query and a very small amount of the cost may actually may come from the response. And so this is just kind of one of those calculations you have to be thinking about, again, in the enterprise world. To be clear, with these tokens, the prices, we'll talk about the prices a little bit more in a second. Uh, these queries are so inexpensive. Onesie, twosie, it doesn't matter. So when I, when I created my account and I got the, the API key, they give you $18 of free credits when you first start out. Uh, with everything that I have done so far, far, I've spent like two bucks. And so that's with all of my testing, all of my playing, classes, the whole nine yards, I've spent like two bucks, maybe. So that's one of the things with this. It is still pretty inexpensive, but again, if you're thinking about that enterprise world, you're having 100,000 users a day hit your infrastructure, a very small, small cost can get very large very quickly. Okay, so pricing. Okay, we talked about the tokens. So what is, what is the actual dollar value of this stuff? So coming, coming from ChatGPT, multiple models, each with different capabilities and price points. Prices are a thousand tokens. You can think of tokens as pieces of words where a thousand tokens is about 750 words. So that's where they're saying now. Maybe it's 750 words. This paragraph is 35 tokens. Right, so this paragraph right here would cost 35 tokens to write out. Now when you first hear that, you're like, oh wow, 35 tokens, that's kind of expensive. But again, their weird model for tokens and all that, if you come down here and you look at it, so the ChatGPT 3.5 turbo model, it costs two, or I'm sorry, it costs $0.002. So it costs one fifth of a cent, one fifth of a penny, not five pennies, not a penny, a fifth of a penny, cause a fifth of a penny for 1,000 tokens. So if this is 35 tokens and it's a fifth of a penny for 1,000 tokens, then I don't know. <laughs> this isn't very much money, right? So again, that's where we, we talk about where trying to, trying to figure out how much this stuff costs uh, can be a little bit confusing because each query or response actually costs so little, but then it builds up the more and more queries that, that you hit the system with. But this kind of gives you an idea here. Uh, where you will get hammered, so do be careful about this, right? So when you're dealing with ChatGPT, the DaVinci model, the, uh, the Turbo model, uh, or even the, the GPT-4 model, it's not gonna cost you a lot of money. Yeah, where you can get into trouble though is the Dolly model. So the Dolly, 
or is it where you give a query and then it spits out an image for you? Uh, so there's different image sizes, resolutions, 1024, 512, and 256. A 1024 image comes out to two cents per image. A 512 image comes out to 1.8 cents per image, and a 256 image uh, costs you 1.6 cents per image. Now that still, that still seems incredibly cheap. Why are we even talking about it? It's so inexpensive. Well, the reason is, is when you ask uh, ChatGPT, Dolly, to give you an image, it's going to give you a very weird image, right? Really, when you're using Dolly, what you want to do is you're most likely going to do is you want 10 images. You want it to produce 10 images, and then you'll pick the one you want. When we go through and we look at the Python script, I'll show you this. There's actually a variable that allows you to put a number of images you want auto-created, and many times you'll put that to five or 10, just because you're gonna get so many bizarre images that you need to get 10 out to find one that might actually be useful. Well, that's where this can get expensive. If you're doing 1024 images at two cents a piece, if you do 10 images per run of the script, that's now 20 cents, right? 10 times two is now 20 cents per run of the script. If you run it once, don't really get images you want like, you run it again, you run it again, you run it again, all of a sudden, Dolly can run through your budget shockingly quickly. So that's one of the things just to keep in mind here is Dolly might actually get pretty expensive for you with ChatGPT. The actual text should be rather inexpensive. These are the things just to keep in mind. Uh, in order to, to pay for the pricing, uh, basically when you go to ChatGPT, you set up an account, you get your free $18 you know, to play around with. Uh, within the settings menu, there's actually a little link down by billing. So you click on billing and there's a place to put in your credit card information. From there, you can put in your credit card information um, and then you can actually, you know, you can buy as much service as you want. One of the things that I will warn you though, is there, there are limits so you can set like a monthly limit for how much you want to spend per month for ChatGPT. And I will highly recommend that you do that. The reason being is, right, this is an API. So you're going to be using Python in order to connect to the API, process what comes back. Well, what happens if you or one of your employees, your interns, does a while true loop? While true continuously hammer the hell out of the API and get a response, right? Might not be thinking about, or they do a loop that will never be true, right? They, they, they screw up the, uh, the greater than or the less than thing. So basically it never gets, to, never gets to true. And so all of a sudden you're literally hammering the API literally as fast as your computer can run. All of a sudden, you know, that, that, that fifth of a cent for a thousand tokens might wind up to be hundreds or thousands of dollars if somebody does something truly stupid. If, if you do that with Dolly, some kind of that, you know, wild true loop, that could be brutally expensive. So when you put your credit card information in, as soon as you do that, go over and set your monthly cap just to make sure this thing doesn't make you go bankrupt. So let's talk about the different models for a second. Again, ChatGPT4 is now out. We do not have access to that particular model. The models that I'm going to be showing you today are GPT 3.5 Turbo and DaVinci 003. Uh, now there are some differences when you use these models, right? So with a, a 3.5, it's the most capable uh, 3.5 model is optimized for chat at one tenth the cost of DaVinci will be updated with our latest model iteration. One of the important things with this is whenever you're looking at the models and which model you're going to use is look at when the training data has been updated until, right? So if you're going to ask a question, you want to make sure that it actually has learned about that particular period of time. So we can see here the training data goes up to September of 2021. So if you ask about 2020, something that happened in 2022 or 2023, it is simply not going to understand uh, you know, what you're asking about, so it, it'll fail out. Uh, if we go down here and we look at DaVinci, uh, can do any language task with better quality, longer output, and consistent instructions following better than Curie, Babbage, and Ada models. So there are other models that you may play with. Uh, with this, the, the training data comes up to June of 2021, right? So these are the two models that we're going to be dealing with today. Now, one of the important things is you're going to have this model endpoint uh, compatibility. Uh, so 3.5 Turbo 
gives you V1 chat completions. So when you're actually parsing uh, the response that comes back, there's one way that you do that with the turbo and with DaVinci uh, uh, 003, you're gonna see the endpoint is V1 completions. Um, I gotta show you a little bit more uh, about those endpoints uh, in, in one of the next slides, but it's just one of those things to keep in mind. When you switch models, not only are you switching the training model, but you're also going to be switching how you ask, how you actually input the query into the API. And when the response comes back, you actually have to format uh, the, the, how you parse the, respo the response properly, uh, or you're not going to get the text that you're looking for. Now, one of the things, again, what's very important here is Again, this is just a whole bunch of verbiage. Um, so it, you may not fully understand the difference between the models and again, why you might want to use DaVinci versus like one of the latest models. And for that, let me actually go show you some code to show you how the turbo model is much more weirdly verbose than the DaVinci model is to kind of give you the idea of a practical difference between these two models. So here's some code that I've written up in VS Code. And basically what we're going to be doing with this code is we're going to create a query. Uh, so the query that we're creating today is does God exist? And then the, what we're going to do is we're going to feed this query first to the ChatGPT 3.5 Turbo model, and then we're going to feed it to the DaVinci model. Now I know some of you are going to be like, oh, look, look, Eli, Eli's showing us the API key. He's dumb. Um, no, I'm just gonna delete this API key afterwards. <laughs> That's how it works, right? Uh, so if you are going to be doing this in the real world, just to be clear, you would actually put your API key into something called an environment variable, and then you would call the environment variable. And the reason that you would do that is so nobody can just simply screen capture what your API key is. The reason that I put my API key here is to make this more understandable to you. Again, please do realize whenever I do classes, whenever I do seminars, I always try to simplify this to make it as easy for people to follow along as possible. And so getting into environmental uh, uh, variables and all that is an extra step of complication. So I just want to show you how you can do this very, very simply. But if you go and you try to copy and paste this API key, it'll be deleted long before, long before you're watching this particular video. So anyways, again, this is Python. So in Python, you always have to import the module that you're going to be using. So import open API or open AI. Uh, so with uh, OpenAI, uh, in order to install this onto your computer, you'll use pip. So it'll be pip install OpenAI, and then the package is installed, and then you can call the module. So first you're going to call the OpenAI module, uh, then you're going to feed the OpenAI module the key, and so this is going to be the key, whatever key that you have. Then for us, we're going to create a query, so the question is going to be, does God exist? Um, we're going to print out question and what the question is. Just again, it's kind of like a troubleshooting things. So we know what question that we're sending. Uh, then we're going to have the response. So this is the function uh, for ChatGPT uh, 3.5 Turbo, OpenAI, Chat Completion Create. We're going to use the model. We're going to talk about this later. Basically, this is how you send uh, the question, the query uh, to this model. And then we're going to print out turbo says, and then we're going to print out the response. So this, this right here is the text that we're going to print out. Uh, then we're going to go down to the DaVinci model, right? And the DaVinci model uh, you'll notice is a lot different. So the response equals open AI completion create. We're gonna give it a model. We're gonna give it the prompt. The prompt is that question we had. There's temperature. So temperature is a way to kind of dial in the quality of your answer. Um, if you're, if you're really doing this for the enterprise world or whatever, you can play around with temperature. For most people, they don't have to worry about it. Um, max tokens. So this is important. So you'll notice with the DaVinci model, it asks you what are the most number of tokens you want to use for this. This can be very important because it's going to use those tokens to spit out a response. And if you do not give it enough tokens, it will literally stop in the middle of the response. And it'll still cost you however many tokens it gave you, right? Uh, so when, you, when I copied and pasted this code when I was originally playing with this, the max tokens was 60. So many times when I ask a question, remember the query, 
cost tokens and the response cost tokens. So many times when I'd ask a question, it would literally get halfway through a sentence and just fail. Um, so that's just kind of one of those things to keep in mind. So with this, I'm giving it, you know, 500 tokens so that it can, uh, Oh, you know, actually spit out a decent response for us. We got frequency penalty and presence penalty. Again, that's, that's stuff to worry about later. Uh, then we're going to print out DaVinci says, and then this is a different, for, so for DaVinci, you actually have a different format for how you print out the, uh, the response. So response is choices at zero index at text, and that's going to spit out a response for us. And so we can go over here to our nice little command prompt. Hopefully that's big enough for you folks to see. Um, I'll do up, up. So Python compare hyphen test dot py. So this will compare. Uh, I will hit enter. So question, does God exist? And again, I'm not, I'm not getting into any stupid stuff. I'm just, I'm just showing you the response. Don't lose your minds, please. Um, and we'll notice, so this is actually connecting the API and this is taking uh, a couple of seconds to run. Again, one of the things to be thinking about with whatever uh, program that you're creating is how fast does it need to run? Um, so different models have different speeds. So that's one thing to keep in mind. Uh, and so here we go. So Turbo says, Turbo says, this is 3.5 Turbo. Again, and this is where I say we get this weird political correctness. <laughs> It's like, come on, Turbo, come on. Anyways, as an AI language model, I cannot answer whether God exists or not as it is a matter of personal beliefs and opinions. Different people have different beliefs about the existence of God and it's a subjective to topic that varies with individual perspectives, right? So that's 3.5, that's one of the newer models. Da Vinci says, the answer to this question is a matter of personal beliefs. Right? So what you have to be thinking about as a technology professional, as a coder, is which one of these answers do you want to parse? <laughs> which one of these answers do you want to have to create code to dissect and then spit out a response that the user is going to care about? Right? Because again, with this, as an AI language model, I cannot answer, right? Like you're going to want to strip that out. Right, so if your if your user asks a question, let's say about God or whatever, and it gives you this, you're actually going to have to code to strip that garbage out because nobody wants to see that garbage. They just want the the last sentence. So this is where, like with Da Vinci, it might actually make a lot more sense to use that older model because it gives you a much more concise and clear answer, right? So this is one of the important things. Again, when we're thinking about that difference, so many times people think, oh, the, the latest model is the greatest. That's the one that we should use. But sometimes, you know, the newer model actually gives you a lot of extraneous information that actually is a pain to deal with as a coder. Now let's take a moment to talk about the endpoints and how to parse the response that you're going to be getting back versus when you're using uh, ChatGPT 3.5 versus ChatGPT 3.0. And again, this is something to keep in mind when you're trying to figure out how to deal with 4.0, right? So again, I talked about before the endpoints and basically the endpoints is how the information, the response is sent back to you. So when you're dealing with the Python world, uh, whenever you have like a named key array or what you would think about like a named key array uh, in, in PHP or something like that, that, that is called a dictionary in the Python world and a standard array that you might deal with, again, in something like PHP, is called a list in the Python world. So when you have a dictionary, you call a key by its name, and when you have a list, you call by the index number, right? So when we're trying to print out the text, right, when we're trying to print out the text, hello there, how may I assist, or this is indeed a test, what you're going to have to do is you're actually going to have to be able to print that out and understand how to get to that level. So if we look at the, uh, the 3.5 model, right? We can see that this opens up as a dictionary. Uh, so let's see, if we come over here, uh, you would put, so uh, it's a response, and then you would do double quotation marks, and then you would do choices. So choices is where the content is, right? So then we do choices, and then we close that. 
And then we'll notice under choices, we open up a list. So we open up a list. There's actually only one item in that list. So that would be at index number zero. So we do index number zero. Then we come down and then we see message. So there's a dictionary for message. Message. And then we come down again and we see content and there's a value for content. So if we're using ChatGPT 3.5, when we're going to print out the text for a response, we would do response choices at index zero message content and that would print out this text. Right, if we go back uh, to chat uh, GPT 3.0, uh, so text Da Vinci, Da Vinci 03, right? So we can see here, uh, we have choices again. So we have choices like we had before. Oops. Uh, so we do response and we do choices. And then we come down and we look at choices. Okay, we have that index zero. So this is, this is a list. That bracket means we start a list. So that would be at index zero of that list. And then we come down and we see text. So then it would be at text. So if we're printing out from uh, ChatGPT uh, 3.5, this, this is how we would format it in order to be able to print out the text. If we're going from 3.0, this is how we'd format it. So that's just one of the things. When you're getting that response, just to understand how lists and dictionaries work so you can actually get down to get at the value you want. That's just an important thing to understand. Again, it's not too hard. It's not too complicated if you can just sit there and you just very slowly, you're like, okay, so this is where it opens. So we go to choices, choices. We go to index zero, index zero. We go to message, then we go to content. That gets us what we're going for. We come here, it's like, okay, so we go to choices. We go to index zero. We go to text, that gets me what I'm looking for. Uh, if you're going to be coding something more complicated, maybe you want the total number of tokens, maybe you want the, the created timestamp or something like that. And so basically you would go through um, and you would basically go through this process in order to figure out where the value is that you're looking for. But when we're talking about the endpoints and how to print out the text that you're looking for from these endpoints, this, this right here is what what we're discussing. So we've done a lot of talk, talk, talk. Let's actually start doing some, uh, some demonstrations so you see how these different models work. So first we're gonna start off with the Da Vinci model so you get an understand of the response that ChatGPT Chat 3.0 can give you and we'll go through some examples. We're gonna, tell it, we'll gonna, we're gonna have it tell us a story, we're gonna have it write some code, we're gonna have it write a, like a blog post with HTML formatting and we're going to have it communicate with an employee just to show that that it can do all of these tasks surprisingly well. So here's the code for DaVinci. This is what I kind of showed you before, but we'll talk about a little bit more here. All right, so we're going to import the OpenAI module as we do. We are then also going to add the API key. Again, this API key will be deleted by the time you watch this video. Then we're going to have a response, right? So the response is going to equal the OpenAI completion create function. Right, so this is going to send um, our prompt to uh, ChatGPT, and then the result we get back is that big endpoint mess that I showed you before, and then we're gonna pull out the text that we want. Uh, so the model that we're gonna use is text uh, DaVinci 003. We're gonna give it a prompt, so we're gonna do that in a second. Uh, a temperature, again, we're not gonna worry about here. A max token, so we're gonna give it a thousand tokens. That's right, we're balling. We're gonna give it a fifth of a cent in order to do this. Uh, we're not gonna deal with the top P or the frequency penalty or the presence penalty or any of this. Again, the temperature and the top P frequency and presence, you should only play with those if it actually really matters to you. For the most part, it generally doesn't. Uh, past that, what we're going to do is I'm going to print out the entire response. So you see what the entire response looks like. Uh, and then we're going to print out just the text from the response so you can see that. Um, so let's see here. So what is the prompt? So the first thing that I want to do is uh, tell a story. Tell a story. So um, tell me a story.
story about a frog and a unicycle. Because that's the kind of person I am. I mean, if we're going to do this, we might as well make it interesting. We're going to do control S, so we're going to slay, save. We're then going to go to the prompt. Hopefully this isn't too big, so it um, goes through. Anyways, uh, so what was that? Da Vinci test. D-A-V-I-N-C-I -I test. Oops. <laughs> Open AI DaVinci. Uh, okay. Uh, Python 3. It's good if you remember the, uh, the names that you name stuff. Open AI DaVinci. Okay, so this is going through. It's coming up. It's coming up with a story about a frog and a unicycle. Let's see what it's going to give us. It's going to take a little bit. There we go. There we go. So we got our response. If we scroll up, if we scroll up, uh, so what we're going to see here is the response, right? So choices, as I showed you before, choices. Um, then we come down to index zero and text. So choices, index zero, text. And then this is all the text that's printed out. Uh, then we can see when it was created. We can see the total tokens that were used. So the uh, completion tokens, it was 306 tokens to complete the task. The prompt tokens were 11. The total tokens were 317. And then the story that we get... Once upon a time, there was a frog named Fred, named the frog, who lived in a pond near a small town. Fred was a very adventurous frog, and he loved to explore the world around him. One day, Fred decided to take a walk around town. As he hopped along, he noticed a unicycle parked outside a store. Fred had never seen a unicycle before, and he was fascinated by it. He hopped closer to take a better look. Suddenly, the unicycle started to move. Fred was so surprised that he jumped back in shock. The unicycle was being ridden by a small girl who was laughing and having a great time. Fred watched in amazement. And anyways, we're going to keep going. Look at that. That's pretty good. That's pretty good. If my kid, if I had a kid and my kid asked me for a bedtime story, it would be chat GPT all the way. No more Walden books. No more Barnes and Noble. I mean, look at the quality of their writing. Fred was a natural. He hopped onto the unicycle and was soon riding around town like a pro. Everyone was amazed at how well he could ride the unicycle. So it literally just completely invented this story, which is an amazing thing. Um, if we wanted to write some code, uh, so this is a big thing, right? You know, with what I do, one of the issues that I run into is I deal with so many different technologies. Many times I deal with different coding languages. And so I don't need to be an expert in all these different coding languages. Many times I just need to solve a problem. So I can literally just ask it how to solve a problem for me. Um, how do I turn a query set into a dictionary in Django, right? So I've been playing around with Django. Django is the web app framework for Python. Uh, when you query the database, you get back something called a query set. That query set isn't a dictionary, so sometimes you need it to be a dictionary. So my question here is just how do I turn it into a dictionary so that I can, I can futz with it if need be, right? Uh, hit Control S to save it. I then go here, Python open AI, DaVinci.py. It's processing. Again, 67 tokens uh, were done. So you can use the dot values method on a query set to turn it into a dictionary. So my query set equals model dot objects all. My dict equals uh, my query set dot values. And so then we can plug it in to Django and see if it works. Uh, generally, this code does work. What I'll, find, what I'll say is kind of interesting when it gives you these code responses is, as I've talked about before, there's 20 ways to skin a cat in the technology world. And what's kind of interesting is almost every time I ask you this question, it gives me an entirely different response. But this can be very valuable. Again, you know, I think about this, you know, I've got these little robot cars and things. And so the back end of it, they use Python, right? They, they use Python. But for the front end, you, we need JavaScript sometimes to do certain things. And so I don't know certain things in JavaScript. Basically, I just need... I need, how do, how, do, how do I trigger a Python script from JavaScript doing something, right? And so what's kind of cool here is you can just come in and ask it, and it's not like Google. Like when you ask Google a question, you get a thousand responses, then you have to click on different things, and then you have to, you know, you have to scroll through banner ads and pop-ups and whatever the hell the person is talking about. What's really great with this is it just spits out an answer. 
Uh, if you don't think this answer is right, you can run it again. We'll see if it gives me a different answer this time. Oh, and it gave me the exact same answer. Oh, well, but again, you could try to run it again or you could ask your question slightly differently to try to get a different response. So this is, again, actually getting those code examples is great. Now, one of the things too, which is cool with this, is that you can actually tell it to format the text in HTML. So one of the uses you know, for ChatGPT is to automatically write blog posts or write articles. If you get back pure text, one of the problems is, is that a web browser doesn't print out pure text most of the time how you want it to be printed out, right? You need the HTML tags. So what's kind of cool here is you can actually tell it to do something with HTML tags. Uh, tell me how to uh, pour a cup of milk and format answer in HTML. All right, we get control S, complicated things like uh, pouring milk. And then we're gonna go here, we're gonna do this. And we're gonna see what the response is. I have no idea. I've, I've, I just pull these kind of questions literally out of my buttocks and we see what happens. <laughs> there we go. Okay, to, so P, to pour a cup of milk. Um, ordered list, so numbered list. Number one, list item, gather a cup. Close list. List two, open the carton. List three. Let's four, close, uh, close the order list down here. So that actually gives you the full description on how you can pour yourself a glass of milk. Uh, again, all completely formatted in HTML. So, you know, if you're trying to do like a history blog and you want to do the Battle of Hastings, for some reason, I keep thinking about the Battle of Hastings for some reason. Anyways, you want to say, hey, I want you to create a blog post about why the Battle of Hastings occurred and format it with HTML. Right, you get back this response, and then you could literally dump this response directly into your database and then call it from WordPress or whatever else to print out on a screen, and that's your automatic web page for you, right? That's one of the cool things that you can do. Uh, one of the other things you can do is do communication. This is what we're going to see more of. Oh, I used to like Salesforce. I used to like Salesforce. I think I might hate them very soon. So Salesforce has talked about this. They feel that cold calling is a low value task for their salespeople. Lord help us. Lord help us. Spaghetti monster help us. So anyways, they want their salespeople to be on high level tasks, not low level tasks. So what they want to do is they want to have chat GPT automatically create like cold email uh, emails, cold call emails to potential clients in order to try to get them as clients. And so you can actually have ChatGPT create these emails. Um, you know, <laughs> spam is only going to get worse. Oh my golly, spam, spam was bad before we had AI. We are now going to have AI driven spam. Um, so, um, create, okay, so what we can do is create an email to Sue Perkins. And so this could be a variable value to just dump in there and ask her if her, if she wants to buy my ice cream maker for $10, right? Uh, pretty simple task, control S. Then we're going to go here to the terminal. We're gonna clear, we're gonna print it out. Open AI Da Vinci. And dear Sue Perkins, I hope this email finds you well. I am writing to ask if you would be interested in buying my ice cream maker for $10. It is an excellent condition and I think it would be a great addition to your kitchen. If you are interested, please let me know and I will be happy to arrange a time for you to come and pick it up. Thank you for your time and I look forward to hearing from you. Sincerely, your name. Uh, yeah. <laughs> A lot, of people, a lot of people ask me, am I excited about AI? No, no, and I'm not. I am not scared of Terminator. I am not scared of war games. I am scared of the sheer 
deluge of spam that we are about to get. But anyways, this shows you what DaVinci can do. And to be clear, DaVinci is the 3.0 model. This isn't even the 3.5 model or the newest 4.0 model. So now let's talk about the 3.5 turbo model. So the coding for the 3.5 model is different than the DaVinci model, but it's, you know, it's five different lines of code. It's not too complicated. One of the interesting things with the turbo model though, is that you actually assign roles to kind of nudge the model in the direction you wanted to go. So one of the big things to be thinking about as a coder, as a technology professional is reusability is one of the most important things whenever you create any kind of technological product. How can I reuse this code? code as much as possible. And so one of the nice parts with the turbo model is you can like write a question and then with these roles, you can nudge it into the particular direction that you want it to go. Uh, so the example that I'm going to show you in a minute is going to ask basically, you know, who, who was the leader in the year 2000? Right? Well, so think about this from the, from the user's perspective, the leader depends on where they're from. Are they from the United States? Are they from the UK? Are they from Brazil? The answer that should be given will depend on what country they're in. So what you can do is with the roles, you can nudge it into that direction. So it basically answers the question for a Brazilian or for an American or for an English person, right? And that's one of the useful things we can do with the turbo model. So here's an example of the code for the 3.5 turbo model. Uh, as always, we import the open AI module. Uh, as always, uh, we have the API key. And then what I'm doing here is I'm creating a variable with a value so that we can tweak the answer that we're gonna be receiving. So this variable value, this could be coming from a database. This could be coming from a, a, some kind of value in a form. This could be getting pulled from anywhere. I'm just doing a static value here to make it easier for you to show, show you folks. Uh, so response equals, so the response we get back is going to equal openai.chatcompletioncreate function. We're going to ask it for the, the, the model, G, GPT 3.5 turbo, and then the messages, right? These are going to be the messages that are going to be sent to ChatGPT 3.5 to try to refine the answer that we're going to be getting back. When we look at roles, there are three roles with ChatGPT 3.5. Uh, there is the system role. So the system role is basically where you tell ChatGPT, what kind of character should they be playing? So basically like here, uh, I say, uh, you are an advisor. So basically you could say as, as a per, you know, as some famous person answer this question or as the president of a country answer this question or as a three-year-old, right? What character profile should you be using to answer this question? And that will, that will change the grammar and basically how things are, how things are said. Then we have the assistant. And basically what the assistant is, when we do the content here, is how we, we want to nudge the, the question in a particular direction. So we're going to say answer as a, and then we have the variable value. So answer as a USA citizen. So when we're answering this question, I want you to answer this on behalf of an American citizen or again, Brazilian or UK, when we show you those examples. And then finally, we have the role of user. And so the user is the actual question that you're asking. So who was the leader in 2000? That's the actual answer. So you will have one role, we will have one input for the role of system. So you are an advisor, you are whatever, you'll put that in. You'll have one for the role of user, that's the actual question that you're gonna be asking. And then you may have multiple for the role of assistant, to try to nudge uh, basically the bias or the direction of the answer to the question. So again, imagine you have a backend database uh, for whatever application you have here, and you have a whole bunch of demographic information, right? You know, race, gender, age, 
all of that type of thing. And so you create a question and you say, I want the most appropriate answer for a woman who lives in California that's above 55 years old, right? So you can try to nudge it. And the cool part is, right, that's dynamic. So the next person might be a man uh, who's 19 year olds in Alabama, you know, basically give me an answer, the exact same question, but bias it based off of this assistant information that I've given. Uh, we're gonna output the text. Uh, for this, we're going to print out the text first and then have the output response below that. Um, just be, oh, no, I'm sorry. We're going to print out the response and then we're going to print out the, the, the text uh, below that. And so let me just go and do that here. So we're going to do clear. Then we're going to do uh, open AI turbo. So this is running through. So who was the leader in 2000? And the answer is, it's a little slow today. It was faster, truly, truly, it was faster when I was doing an in-person seminar. So that, again, that's one of the things you have to be thinking about is when you're creating your web application is how fast these answers are gonna come back. Uh, so again, so we have the, uh, the response, so choices, uh, so choices at index zero, message content, that's the content. Uh, we have the created time, we have the model, we have the tokens used, 81 tokens. Uh, so in the year 2000, the leader of the United States was President Bill Clinton. However, his second term in the office was coming to an end and the country was gearing up for the presidential election later that year. Uh, so it gave a response and it get, gave a little bit more additional information. Again, that's one of the things I find with 3.5. It's a little verbose, a little verbose. Not necessarily a bad thing. But again, when you're thinking about parsing the response, it might be an issue for you. Uh, let's see, if we go here, the nationality of Brazil, so exact same question. We just simply feed it Brazil instead of USA. We hit Control S. We come down here, we clear. We run the script again. Running, running, running. Again, it's taking longer. <laughs> It's taking longer. Of course, of course, when I'm doing a video, that's the time it would take longer. Anyways, Fernando Henrique Cardoso was the leader of Brazil in the year 2000. He served as the president of Brazil from 1995 to 2003 and was the first Brazilian president to be reelected for a second consecutive term since the end of the military dictatorship. Blase, blase, blase. And so what's really cool about this, right, is so you can have that one question and then simply by changing the variable value, you can get a much different answer. And this is the, the one of the powerful things with this type of AI technology is the, is the idea of customizing the answer for the particular user that's asking the question. And if you, as a tech professional, as the coder, can extract as much demographic or as much uh, you know, specific information about that user as possible, you can really start slanting these answers to, to hopefully make the answer as useful as possible to that end user. So this is all there is for the, uh, the, 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 the 3.5 turbo. Um, again, these roles is where it gets really kind of cool. The big thing here is you're able to slant the answer to the question based off of these assistants and the assistants you can simply feed by concatenating in the values uh, of variables. Now, when we start thinking about our users asking our web application questions and it going and querying ChatGPT, one of the things that we have to think about is to make sure that our users get the right answers, right? Because, you know, there's a lot of different truths out there. Everybody has their own facts nowadays. So how can we make sure that the user gets the response that we think is the most, most appropriate for them? Well, one of the ways that you can do that is actually concatenate on additional information to the query that is being sent to ChatGPT to try to skew the answers in particular directions in ways that the end user may not even think about. Again, one of the, the powerful things about AI from a psychological standpoint is for some reason, don't ask me why, but people think computers are right. If a computer says it, it is true. Think about how powerful that is psychologically. 
So if on the back end you can skew answers into a particular direction, it's more easy to get people to go along with it, whatever your world viewpoint is. Look, the AI agrees with me, so obviously I'm right. <laughs> no, you can't audit the back end code. <laughs> Well, I would let you audit the code, but you don't really want to do that. So what I want to show you uh, right now is an example of how I was able to concatenate additional information into a particular script. And then we're going to loop through and based off of the type of person that we're saying is asking the question, uh, ChatGPT is actually going to give an entirely different response. <laughs> So this is where things either get fun or they get dark or they get fun and dark all at the same time. One of the things I really try to hammer home to, to my students, whether you come to an in-person seminar or whether you're watching one of these videos, is to always remember when you're doing tasks in information technology, the tasks that we are doing are based off of the human condition, right? There, again, there's this weird idea that somehow technology is pure, right? So humans are confusing and scary. Again, you have a lot of autistic people in the technology world or Aspies in the technology world. Humans are scary. Technology, that's something you can depend on. And so you get folks going to technology. One of the issues that people forget is that technology is used to solve human problems and many times to solve it in ways that humans want that problem to be solved. So when you're doing things like writing code, it's important to think about not just loops and not just setting variable values, but also thinking about how your app is going to be used. And if you kind of need to add a little bit of humanity into that app, one way or the other. Uh, so with this app, basically it's, again, we're dealing with the Da Vinci model, like we dealt with before, the 3.0 model, because it's not so uh, verbose. We don't want verbose, we just kind of want a simple thing here, just to give you an idea of what's going on. Uh, we have the, the OpenAI module, we have the API key, and then I've created a list here. And so the list is called Slant. And so the, in the slant list, we have Christian, we have scientist, we have Pastafarian, we have Republicans, and we have Democrats. So one of the interesting things here is just to see what the bias of ChatGPT is. What does ChatGPT think about Republicans or Democrats? That's kind of an interesting thing. And the other thing is we can actually see how we can skew the answer to a particular question. The question is going to be, how did the world begin? To be clear, I'm not trying to get into any argument with anybody. I think this is just an interesting one just to throw in there. Again, especially with the modern world, right? You got the whole intelligent design on one side, you got the evolutionists on the other, you got the Pastafarians just saying, hey, can't we all relax? Anyway, so we got that question here. So what I'm gonna do is 4x in slant. So this is a for each loop. So for each value in the slant list, submit. So the, the question is going to be, how do Christian, scientist, Pasifarian, Republicans, Democrats, think, question, how did the world begin? So how do Pasifarian think, how did the world begin, right? We have the, uh, the response equals the, uh, the create function, the DaVinci uh, text model, the prompt, so that submit that we created here, so we're concatenating, right? So text concatenating with the string of X, concatenating with think, concatenating with question, turns that all into one long string. That gets submitted as the prompt. We have the temperature we don't worry about, uh, the max tokens, so we're just gonna keep it at 60 to keep it simple here, the rest of this, um, and then basically uh, print string, so as a, and then print out, so as a Christian, as a scientist, whatever, and then print out uh, the question, and then print out the answer, right? So this is kind of interesting here. Uh, hit Control S, we go over here, open AI test. Uh, so uh, Python 3, open AI hyphen test dot PY. And so now we can see the evil bias, right? Um, so it's printing out, so I'll let it finish off as a Pastafarian, as a Republican, as a Democrat. I think this is kind of interesting just to take a look at. As a Christian, how did the world begin? Christians believe that the world was created by God according to the Bible. God created the world in six days and rested on the seventh. 
right? So if somebody put in how did the world begin, and then it's spitting out that the world was created by God. Uh, as a scientist, how did the world begin? The scientists think the world began with the Big Bang Theory, which states that the universe began as a single extremely hot and dense point. Uh, if we go down to Pastafarians, Pastafarians believe that the world was created by the flying spaghetti monster. According to the church of the flying spaghetti monster, the flying spaghetti monster created uh, the, the world after drinking heavily. Right? Then here's kind of what's interesting. Here's what's interesting. As a Republican, how did the world begin? Republicans generally believe that the world began with the creation of the universe by God. They believe that God created the universe and all of its contents, including the earth and all living things. So think about this. Again, we talk about like bias and something like AI. Republican is a political party, right? And they used to believe in low taxes and small government and and a strong military and some other things. But think about this. Chat GPT is literally doing a religious bias on a political party, good or bad. Democrats, and if we scroll down Democrats, Democrats generally believe that the world began with the Big Bang Theory, which states that the universe began with a single, infinitely dense point of matter, blase, blase, blase. So based off of the concatenation, the adding of the bias that we wanted to put into the answer, we actually got five entirely different answers. And so this is something for you to be thinking about when you're creating your app, do you want to concatenate on a few different things just to make sure you get the right type of answer? And again, it may not even be bias, it may not even be bias. You may just uh, want to concatenate on format in HTML. Right, so let's say you're going to have your users or writers create blog posts about different subjects. And now they need to put in format in HTML to make sure it gets formatted. But, you know, employees are employees. You can tell them to do something. Whether or not they're going to do it is a whole different story. So what if you could just have them type in the question or the prompt for a blog post and then automatically concatenate on format as HTML? Right? That might be useful for you. Or again, like the English language is very interesting when you travel around the world. Is English is not English. English in the United States is different than English in the UK, which is different than English in Ireland, which is different than English in India, which may or may not be, I haven't been to Pakistan, may or may not be different than English in Pakistan, right? So depending on where you're writing, or again, if you're creating some kind of content farm, you may, you may plug in, you know, answer as an American answer as a Brit, answer as a Canadian, and it will slightly change, right, the syntax and language that's most appropriate for the target market that you're going at. And you can just very easily do that by adding this concatenation directly into the, to the, the prompt that's going to be sent so that you don't have to worry about it or tell your employees, your contractors that they have to manually add in that kind of information. So now that we've dealt with the text uh, responses from ChatGPT, let's look at the image responses using Dall E. Uh, now I will say, if it is close to your bedtime and you're scared of the dark, you're scared of the boogeyman or boogie girl, probably leave this for tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> Dolly, Dolly is amazing. Let me be clear. Dolly, from a technological standpoint, is absolutely amazing. It's also one of the creepiest things I've seen in my life. Um, it will. It will give you an image. And you may have nightmares for a long time from that image. Um, Basically, when we're dealing with Dolly, uh, you're going to give it a prompt, just like we've been given a prompt before. Again, there's, there's five lines of code, essentially. We're just going to, I'm going to go through that in a second. One of the big things to remember with Dolly is that the URL that you're going to be given is going to be active for maybe an hour. Again, I have not been able to get a definitive length of time for how long the, 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 the URL exists for, but it seems like an hour is a decent amount of time, right? So if you're creating an application and you do like an IMG, SRC, so basically you're just embedding an image into your website, make sure you use wget or make sure you use something to download that image so that the image doesn't go poof uh, after about an hour. Uh, I think that's one of the important things to be thinking about when you're using Dolly. Uh, past that, let's just go over and I'll show you the, uh, show you the code and I'll show you the very, very creepy responses. 
So before I show you the code, I figured I'd just show you <laughs> some of the output. You know, just so you get an idea what you're getting into with Dolly. So now with me, I just plug in a lot of weird random prompts to see what it'll give me. So this prompt right here is I said, a goat on a bus going to battle clowns. And so I got like a clown goat driving a bus. So we got this here. Uh, this... So I was putting in a lot of fun, I was putting in like a lot of weird things for a while. And I was like, you know what? Let me, let me, let me just ask a normal prompt, right? So I literally plugged in woman on a bus. And this, this is what I got. This is what I got. Um, look at that face. <laughs> look at that face. <laughs> it's like two left eyes or two right eyes. It's just particularly weird. I think that's the funny thing with Dolly. You get, again, you give it like crazy, give it crazy uh, requests and you get crazy responses. You give it normal requests and then it just gets really dark. Uh, let's see, other things. Um, so I don't know, this was like a goat in a bar. So it gave that kind of styling there. Uh, a goat, a clown, and a taco at a bar uh, gives us this. Um, <laughs> this was funny, this was hilarious. So I got a little political, I got a little political. So I was like, hey, what about a Republican in love with a sheep? I don't know why, I just plugged it in there. And for some reason, it put Obama there. <laughs> Obama's in love with a sheep. Again, the responses that you get is so curious. And this is actually interesting. So I said like a goat, I was like, give me a picture of a goat in World War II. And that's actually a pretty darn nice picture, I gotta say. I don't know, goats in World War II? Phenom phenomenal, I don't know why. Again, this is another goat in World War II. It does really well with doing goats in World War II. Another goat in World War II. Phenom that's, that's pretty, I, I would print that out and put that on a wall. Uh, kid, kid at a computer, uh, it did that. Uh, person at a computer, it did that. Uh, cat attacking a town, it did that. Kid riding a cat. Kid riding a cat. <laughs> this is one of the ones I love. Kid riding a cat. Um, so yeah, so basically these are some of the different examples just to show you of what, um, oh, what, uh, what you can get. Uh, so beyond that, uh, this is the code. This is the code. Oops, I think I forgot to paste control V, control S. Got to put in the right API key. Again, the API key will be deleted before you watch this video. Don't. Okay, so for the dolly. So import OpenAI, AI key, response equals OpenAI.ImageCreate. So you give it a prompt. So last prompt was kid using a computer. You give it a number, so n equals five. What this means is it will give you five images at a shot. So this means it'll cost you 10 cents if you're doing 1024 or whatever, I'm just plugging in 256 because I don't want to spend that much money. So this is the size. So this is where you put in the 512 or the 1024 or the 256. I'm just doing 256. The image URL equals response data zero URL. Uh, let's see here. We're going to print out the response. So you see the URLs. The other thing that I'm going to do here is I'm going to open a document, dolly-test.html. I'm basically then going to write to it and I'm going to embed these images. 4x in response data, image src, string of the URL, close, and then close. So basically what this is going to do is it's going to print to this dolly test file and it's going to embed all of those images using the IMG SRC so we can see everything on one page. So I don't know, a kid using a computer, that's, that's too normal for a seminar, we're not doing normal here. Let's see, say goat, uh, goat riding, a, oops, riding a cow on a mountain, right? That's, that's the kind of thing we're going to do around here. We're going to do control S, obviously. Uh, yep, make sure it's saved. Then we're going to go here, uh, clear, uh, python3, dull e hyphen test.py. And this is going to go through and it's going to process. 
process, process, process. Okay, so here we go. So those URLs, so that response, right? So printing out the response, printing out the response. Um, that is what we're printing out here. And you see these are the URLs. So we're not, we're, we are not automatically downloading the images. We're simply getting the URLs for the image. Uh, from here, I can simply click on it and do open link. And I get that particular picture. So <laughs> there we go. Um, is that a cow? Anyways, we can go here. And if I hit refresh, there we go. So this is, this is that web page that I created. And so a goat riding a cow on a mountain. 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 Right? And so by having five of these images, I can decide which one I prefer, right? And they're all slightly different, um, so I might prefer one or the other. Uh, if we go over again, I don't know, we can do something else weird. Let's say uh, a kid riding a llama in the, the circus. Uh -huh. Control S. I'm going to process that. I'm simply going to run the script again. Uh, running, 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 running. Again, taking a little long today. Taking a little long. Okay, that ran. Again, we have that, this page that's automatically being recreated every single time. I refresh this, and there we go. <laughs> the faces are the weirdest thing. I don't Can you see that face? Here, um... I don't know if you can really see that. I don't know. Doll E, doll -E and human faces is just pure nightmare fuel. But anyways, kid on a llama circus. 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 You know, you can plug this kind of stuff in, and then you get to decide, you know, whether or the re whether the results are what you're looking for. But again, like. Other than the weird distortions of the faces, it is, it is surprisingly good. Now that we've taken a look at the image API with Doll E, we can look at the audio API with Whisper. As far as I can understand, Whisper is now currently like in beta phase, so you don't seem to need to give it any tokens when you upload content in order to get a transcript from it. Uh, so that will probably change somewhere in the future. So somewhere with this code, you'll probably just have to, you know, add some tokens or whatnot. Just kind of keep that in mind. It shouldn't be any big deal. Uh, the Whisper API is, wow, it is simple. Wow, it is simple. It's amazing. Like, like three lines of code. It's not even four lines of code. It's three lines of code <laughs> is all you need in order to transcribe audio. Fabulous. Import OpenAI, you do the audio file, so you give it the path to the audio file, then you do the transcript, so transcribe with Whisper 1 for the audio file, uh, and then it will simply uh, give you a response. You can also translate audio. There's like 50 languages that they translate into English. So take that as it is. I'm not going to get in the middle of that particular argument. So you can translate languages into English. You cannot currently translate languages from English or from English into other languages. Uh, but again, you know, basically pretty, pretty simple code here. So with that, let's go over to the, the actual uh, page and I'll show you how this works. So this is the code for uh, Whisper, uh, pretty simple. So import open AI, you need to do that. Uh, you do actually need to give it the API key. So here's the API key that you feed it. But again, you're not actually feeding it tokens, so who knows what it's actually gonna cost you at the end of the day. You're then going to create a variable uh, for the audio file, and you're going to open uh, the audio file, so w-test.mp3, so you're gonna do that. Then transcript is going to equal open AI audio transcribe whisper one uh, for the uh, oh for the for the model and then the audio file what you have here and then we're simply going to print out the transcript Easy peasy, right? So if I go down to Audacity, uh, if you're using Ubuntu, Audacity is the easiest way to just record off of the microphone and be able to dump it into something like an easy to find MP3 file. So that's what we're going to do here. And um, I don't know, I'm just going to talk. So I'm going to talk some words, like I'm going to, I'm going to be saying words for my class 
and hopefully the Whisper API will be able to determine what words I'm saying. Then we're gonna stop it, and then we're gonna do file, we are going to export, gonna export as an MP3, so again, these MP3 files could be coming from, from anywhere. You could be export, you know, you could be use Handbrake or FFmpeg to pull the audio file out of videos, something like that. And I'm gonna do export MP3. I'm just going to select the, the W-3 test that I already had created. We will save, we will replace it, because I'm lazy. We're gonna hit OK. And then we're going to come here. We got our command prompt. Whisper test, that's our Python script. It's going to go through. So text, so I'm gonna talk some words, like I'm gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna be saying words for my class and hopefully the Whisper API will be able to determine what words I'm saying. So look at that, look at that. Audio, oops, audio transcription that easily. And the important thing to understand as a technology professional is dealing with audio files is hard. Turning an audio file into a text file, blow your mind that's difficult to deal with. Dealing with ASCII text, that's easy, right? Uh, so one of the examples I saw, so Fireship, Fireship is a, is a good channel to watch on YouTube, and they showed an example where they used JavaScript on a web page so you could push a button to record audio, basically to ask the web app to do something. Uh, that audio was turned into an MP3, it was submitted to Whisper, Whisper sent back the text from that audio file, and then you're able to parse and look for a command. So you could hit the record button and you could say, tell me what the weather is going to be you know, on Friday. Uh, that audio gets sent to Whisper, Whisper sends back the text, and then that text can be used for chat GPT or any other kind of query that you're going to use so that the user is able to get the results that you're, that you're looking for. Uh, so this, you know, again, this is Whisper, and it, it is amazing. I mean, just look at that. Look at that. Four lines of code. Import, key, audio file, transcript. Well, five lines. And then doing something with the results. This is the world that we're currently in. Now, one of the next services that are offered by the, the ChatGPT API is moderation. So I'm not going to go through the full code on this. I think we've shown you enough code at this point. But what moderation is really good for is imagine you have any kind of communication system and basically you're trying to cr keep the language clean. Again, uh, you have bullying, you have trolling, you have whatever else you know going on with the communications. Simply being able to scan those communications and look for the hatefulness or whatever uh, within that communication might be a useful thing. The other thing to look for with something like moderation is just from a management standpoint, imagine if you have a system that's constantly scanning the emails or the messages of your employees or the users of your organization, just looking for red flags. Uh, I'm going to tell you something, and this may shock you, but leaders and managers are not nearly as impressive as people want to think they are. It's kind of funny, right? You look nowadays and you go to LinkedIn or whatever, and you, you see what a leader is supposed to be or a manager is supposed to be. And there's like these 20 bullet points on what a leader is. And I always giggle. I always giggle. I'm like, good luck with that. You know what a manager is? A manager is an employee that has to deal with other employees. And here's the deal. Some of them are good. Some of them are not so good, right? Some of them need help. So one of the things as a manager you can run into a problem is if you've got 10 employees or 20 employees or 50 employees under you, knowing, knowing which employees are struggling, knowing which employees are getting frustrated or angry, and just simply, just simply knocking on their door and saying, hey, I just want to make sure everything is okay, right? Because managers and leaders get tunnel vision like everybody, right? They get tunnel vision and they focus on their best employees and they focus on their worst employees and then they kind of forget everybody else. So one of the problems you can have is you can have a good employee, not a rock star, but a good, solid employee that's valuable for the company, but they're not the worst 
but they are. They're having family problems or they're getting frustrated or there's some issue. So day after day after day, they're getting a little bit more angry, a little bit more angry, a little bit more frustrated. Since the boss is tunnel visioned on the best performers or the worst performers, they forget about the middle folks. And then all of a sudden you have an explosion in your, your middle group and they quit or there's some mess or whatever else. One of the things I really argue for, for a lot of these AI systems, is basically just having what we call a single pane of glass uh, to look at the analytics of what's going on with, with overall your institution, uh, just to see where you might start to have problems. So imagine, right, uh, with a moderation type system that's constantly scanning messages and all that, you know, everybody gets a baseline. Right? Everybody gets a baseline. You know, your low performers are always pissed off, your high performers are always happy, and the middle people are somewhere in the middle. One of the interesting things, if you're constantly scanning all these messages and just looking for point values, to be clear, you're not reading the messages themselves, it's all being done by the computer, but you're looking for point values for frustration and hate and all that kind of stuff. And if all of a sudden, if all of a sudden, a couple of your employees start spiking up, that may just be an alert to you, just as a good manager, to just say, hey, want to make sure everything's doing okay. Is there anything I can do to make your job easier, right? If you try to solve the problem when you have a little spike, it'll probably, you know, keep you from having a bigger blow up later. Or again, when we talk about hate speech or trolling or whatever else, remember, right? Adults, adults like to lie to their kids. Adults like to lie to their kids. And the, the adults look at their kids and say, I know high school is bad, kiddo, but don't worry. Once you're an adult, it will stop. <laughs> oh, are you still telling your kid that Santa Claus exists too? The reality is bullying doesn't stop. Let me be crystal clear. I'm in my mid 40s. I can tell you bullying doesn't stop. Physical intimidation doesn't stop. It's, it's more of a low roar the older you get, but it's still there. One of the issues you can have is, again, communication between employees and your company. You may not know as a boss or a manager how raw or nasty that communication is is because it's party-to-party -party communication. But if you had some system to go, wait a minute, this salesperson or this person, right, they're really spiking on kind of like the hate or sexual innuendo or whatever else. I need to go and we need to have a, a, a discipline session or we need to have a session with that person before we have the sexual, uh, sexual harassment lawsuit, before we have the discrimination lawsuit, right? So that's one of the things that can be really powerful with moderation. And so like with this, it shows you, you know, you import OS module, import open AI module, give it the key, and then the, uh, the input. So this input value, again, could be coming from a database, it could be coming from somewhere else, and the input equals, I want to kill them. Again, if one of my employees is saying anything along the lines of I want to kill them, I definitely want to knock on that door and see what's going on. So when we're looking at the moderation API and a bit of the, an overview of it, uh, so they have categories, you know, hate, content that expresses, incites, or promotes, hate based on race, gender, ethnicity, blase blase, hate threatening, hateful content that also includes violence or serious harm, self-harm. Again, if you have an employee that's depressed and starts, you know, messaging, maybe I should just end myself, you know, maybe a knock on the door would be a wise idea. Sexual, content meant to arouse sexual, uh, 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 sexual uh, excitement. Um, again, this should not happen. <laughs> Let me be crystal clear. This should not happen in a business environment. Um, we all know it does, right? Again, one person communicating with another employee. I want to nip that in the bud as quickly as possible. Sexual with minors, oh hell no. Violence, graphic violence. So these are all different categories within the moderation thing. Um, if you go down, basically uh, it'll show you uh, when you get the results back, uh, you get whether it's hate, whether it's hate threatening, self-harm sexual, and you actually get uh, numbers based off of that, right? So let's go over here. Here's the moderations, right? So again, create moderation. Uh, this is the endpoint. 
Uh, if we have here, again, we have the example that's going out. Oops, that's Node.js. We don't want Node. We want Python. Uh, so again, this is the I want to kill them. So the input is I want to kill them. And this is the response we get, right? So we get the basic categories. So basically just a true false. Uh, so hate is false. Hate threatening is true. Self-harm is false. Sexual false. Sexual minor is false. Violence true. Violence Violence graphic is false. So that's just a true or false thing if you just need a very, a very blunt measurement. What's interesting down here though is that we then get to um, an actual number score, right? Uh, wait a minute. Uh, there we go. So the number score. So with a number score, this is between zero to one. And so you see for hate, right? Hate is 0.22. Um, hate threatening is 0.41, self-harm is 0 0.005, sexual is 0 0.01, sexual minors is 0 0.00, violence is 0.92, so almost one, violence graphic is 0 0.036. And so since you get this number, right, again, one of the other things that you can do is you can simply, you know, store this particular data and start to get a baseline for how your customers or for how your users are communicating and then you can either see spikes or you can see drops based off of what is going on. You can also see the communication for your entire company, your entire organization, right? Maybe, maybe they're a little bit, you know, maybe all of your employees are a little bit more sexual than you would like. Um, maybe all of your employees, you know, talk a little bit more violent, right? So you may have a baseline and then the thing is to look for the spikes, to look for the deviations where employees are going outside of what may be normal in your company. Uh, what may also be uh, useful here too is again, from a management standpoint, understanding how your company actually communicates. One of the big problems is for the executives, right? You go up to the top floor, you get that corner office, you do start to separate from the warehouse workers. You do start to separate from the sales workers and the marketing people and all of that. You may actually lose track with, you know, what they're all saying to each other, and that might wind you up into a lawsuit or bigger problems going into the future. So this whole, uh, this whole thing with moderation might be very useful for you, again, for messaging systems, so scanning Slack, uh, sc scanning email, scanning any of the, the social media accounts, any type of thing like that, any place where you can simply go out and basically grab, uh, grab text, be able to throw it through this API, this might be something useful for you to track how your people are feeling. And then we have identifying uh, user abuse and end users. So one of the issues that you may run into with this API is that there are API violations, right? If you ask for child porn from Dolly or ask how to kill somebody from ChatGPT, your account is going to get flagged. You get too many of those flags. Everything's going to go bad, right? Because everything is at the account level. So one of the things that you can do is you can actually add a user value variable and the value for that variable could come in from a database or a session value so that when the account gets pinged for an API violation, you know who the hell did it right? Because uh, that's going to be a big thing, right? When you, when you want to stay in the good graces of any company that's providing you with an API, the people providing you with an API, especially if they know you have a lot of users hammer, hammering your app, they know there's going to be trolls and all of those kinds of people. The important question is how you are going to deal with the trolls. If you do not have a way to identify individually who's violating the rules, then you're kind of screwed. And so the, the, whoever's providing you with the API, if you can't stop it, they'll just cut off your API access. So one of the nice things here is you can add this user value so that, again, if one of your users is doing something nefarious, trying to use the API in the incorrect way, that can get flagged and then you can, uh, you can disable or you can delete that particular account. So that's something that's useful in here, again, in a multi-user multi setup for your platform. 
One of the things to be thinking about when you use ChatGPT or any kind of open AI solution or AI solution is what are you going to be do doing with your results? And one of the things that I would highly recommend is that you cache your results, right? So every time you ask for an image from Dolly, it's going to cost you money, whether it's one and a half cents or whether two cents, it's going to cost you for every image. You ask for 10 or 20 or 100 images, it's going to cost you money. You're literally paying for those images. And so one of the things that I would recommend is why don't you just automatically download them into a data store so that you have them in the future, right? Something just to think about there. Instead of continuously requesting, you know, the same types of images, you just download everything and maybe one of those weird images that you don't like for your project is perfect for somebody else's project and you don't have to pay two cents or two dollars or whatever else. Uh, one of the other things to be thinking about too is caching the GPT results. Um, you know, again, somebody asks qu a question, they get, a res or they get an answer from chat GPT. One of the important things to understand about humans is we're all kind of sort of the same. I know, we all think we're unique. We all think we're special little snowflakes. Uh, that's just not the truth. <laughs> just not the truth. We're all kind of the same. We all kind of ask the same questions. We all kind of sort of have the same problems, especially in a business or an organization. So one of the things you might do is cache the questions being asked and the answers being given. And then you can have somebody go through and look at the answers that are coming back. And if it's in a database, you may just have them go in and edit uh, the answers to be a little bit more appropriate for your environment. And then what you could have is somebody could ask a question, the initial response for that question will actually get pulled from your local database. Since the question has already been asked before, here are the three answers that we already have in the database. Like you could flag one, this is the official answer from the company. And then if that's not what the user is looking for, they could hit another button to actually you know, hit ChatGPT and get an entirely different answer. Uh, that can be valuable because that means that you can edit uh, the response that your end user is going to be get to be most appropriate for your particular environment. It means that you're not hammering the hell out of ChatGPT, so you're not paying those API fees. Again, onesie twosie users on your web app, it doesn't really matter, but if you've got thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, or millions of people on your web app, those API calls will start to cost a lot of money pretty soon. Uh, so that's one of the things to be thinking about is re reducing the, the uh, API usage fees. Uh, and then also things to be thinking about is improve operational security. One of the big things with caching is that you're going to your local infrastructure, users are going for the local infrastructure so that the communications are not going outside of your infrastructure. You don't have to worry about man in the middle attacks or anything like that where somebody may be trying to collect the questions or the answers that are coming back to your organization. Again, something to consider. Now, currently, currently, as I've been informed, ChatGPT now, as of whatever this is, March 17th or whatever, 2023, or March 12th, whatever, 2023, uh, currently they are not, as I understand, <laughs> caveat this, as I understand, using your questions to teach chat GPT, right? The models. So these models, you can have self-learning models where the models are continuously learning. Why that's important, especially going into the future, is the Amazon, the big wigs at Amazon, literally had a crap fit when they realized that their engineers were dumping engineering questions into chat GPT or, and other AI solutions looking for answers. Right? So again, where I showed you, you know, it'll show you how to, to write a piece of code or whatever. Things you can do with ChatGPT is you can say, hey, can you optimize this code? Hey, can you see a vulnerability or a problem in this code? Well, the issue was, is you had some Amazon engineers copying entire blocks of proprietary Amazon code, <laughs> dumping it into ChatGPT. And then the issue is, is ChatGPT gives an answer, but if ChatGPT is then learning from that code that it cost Amazon millions of dollars to create, 
at some point in time, somebody else is going to be asking a question and all of a sudden an answer is going to pop out that looks a hell of a lot like Amazon's code, right? So this is something to be very, very, very careful about. Again, one of the things that I always argue whenever you're thinking about APIs is again, you do not necessarily know what the vendor is doing with all of these queries. You don't necessarily know how they're logging things or whatever else. So do be careful with APIs and make sure you only send out uh, the information that you do need to send out and make sure it's sanitized and that type of thing. Uh, you know, they talked about that before. Some API so or AI solutions where API keys are getting automatically filled in because somebody dumped API keys into some learning model and now the AP, like active API keys are getting spit out. So one of the things to be thinking about is when you create an app to submit something to any kind of AI solution, is there some kind of sanitization within that, that, that app that you created to do things like remove the, uh, move the API keys so those kind of things don't leak? This is an important thing to be thinking about. Again, right now, right now, the second, they're not supposed to be learning from the, uh, from the input information. That could change at any time. And the other thing to be thinking about is there's a lot of competitors out there. Just because OpenAI is doing something doesn't mean a different competitor isn't, and you can get into a mess, right? If you always, if you always try to build secure, again, you're always building for a zero trust environment, generally you won't be let down. So we're winding up to the end of the seminar. Uh, we did not talk about ChatGPT4 because literally, I crap you not, on Tuesday, on Tuesday, this is what I received. Please join us today at 1 p.m. Pacific time, four o'clock my time, for the live demo of GPT4 with the API. So the API waitlist came out for GPT4. And so you can go on that wait list and you may or may not get access to GPT-4 for any amount of time. Again, with this class, I've shown you Whisper, I've shown you Dolly, I've shown you the DaVinci model and the 3.5 Turbo model. All of those models will, will remain relevant going into the future. And even when 4 comes out, you may still find that DaVinci actually solves your problem better than the brand new model. Uh, as I showed you with 3.5, 3 3.5 is just wordy as hell. <laughs> It just goes on and on and on. You go to, you go to DaVinci, DaVinci gives you an answer. DaVinci gives you one sentence. 3.5 Turbo is like, la, 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 la. And you, you have to take all of that and turn it into a format that your user can do something with. So yes, 4 is now supposedly out. Whether you're going to be able to get access to that API is a different story. And even when you're able to get access to that API, it doesn't discount anything we talked about today. Now, where do you go from here if you want to start playing with the AI, uh, playing with the API and such? Uh, the main thing is make sure you learn Python. Uh, so again, when we talk about programming languages and which programming language you should learn, it really comes down to what problem are you trying to solve and what APIs have the vendors created for you? Uh, so when you look at OpenAI, uh, they seem very, very, very friendly with Python. It does appear to be a Python first environment. So if you know, you know Python, you should be able to sail through it. Uh, there is a Node.js API. To be clear, from what I've been able to see, I don't think it's at the same level as the Python API. I could be wrong there. To be clear, I could be wrong, but it does seem like Python is the way to go. Uh, if you know a different coding language, uh, it does not appear that there are official APIs out there, but if you go to GitHub, there are ways to kind of work around the system and make something work. But mainly, I'd say if you want to start playing with uh, ChatGPT, just learn some Python. Again, I showed, I showed you literally how to do a lot of this stuff. You don't really have to learn that much uh, Python. Uh, you can sign up for the ChatGPT API. Uh, you initially get $18 in credit, or I don't know, I got $18 in credit. I'm kind of confused. They may have changed that. I saw something where it's like you get $5 in credit for the first three months now. I don't know. If you sign up for the ChatGPT API, they give you some amount of credit. As long as you stay to text, 
again, DaVinci or a 3.5 turbo, uh, even if it's $5, it'll last you forever. Uh, as soon as you get into images, that is where you'll swallow actually a decent amount of money. Uh, but if you want to keep playing with it, again, you can plug in your credit card number and away you go. You can play with AI as much as you want. So that's basically where you go if you want to start uh, understanding more about how all this works. So I hope you enjoyed this particular seminar. And as I say at the end of all these seminars, most of these seminars, please steal this presentation. When I look at scaling Silicon Dojo, frankly, I don't know. I'm in my mid 40s. I'm kind of tired. I don't want to do it. I don't want to do it. I want you to do it, right? The concept, when we talk about dojo, so many times people use words, but they don't really mean the words that they're using. I really do mean it. Again, I spent 20 years doing martial arts, and one of the most amazing things about martial arts is you can have somebody that comes in, they get up to black belt level, or not even black, up, black belt level. They get to whatever level they want to get to. They can go out, they can create their own martial arts studio and go from there, right? Nobody copyrighted Taekwondo or Tai Chi or Kempo or Shotokan or any of that, right? You learn it, and then when you get to whatever level you think is appropriate, you can go out there and teach it. Um, I've had many people over the years, I've been doing YouTube since 2009, I have people, had people come up to me from India that said, I was in a backwater village in India, and I now work at Cisco because of your videos. Uh, I had somebody here in Asheville come up to me that said he was from Africa. He literally stated that his village did not have internet access, so he walked to a another village with internet access to download my old videos so he could bring it back to his village and watch those videos. And now he's in university in Cincinnati. I have talked with so many people. And so one of the things that I'm thinking about with Silicon Dojo is, again, how this can scale and how this can grow. And the way that I would like that to be done is I think it would be amazing if somebody in Mogadishu or Somalia or Colorado or Mexico or whatever else saw these videos, liked what I was doing, Doing, took the types of information that I'm providing and created their own dojo. Again, you can do this. I've got, I've got a 700 square foot room. Now to be clear, it's in Hatch in Asheville, North Carolina. So it does cost a couple of dollars and I've got some nice things here. But realize this could be a basement. I just need 700 square feet. This could be a basement. This could be a garage. You could literally have folding tables and folding chairs and people's cast off computers and you can teach Python and Linux and all these other coding languages and such, as well as any college can. You don't need a lot of money and resources to do what I'm doing. So if you like what I'm doing here, again, please, please take this. Um, the, the, uh, the presentation itself and all of the code will be on GitHub hopefully by the time you're watching this video. So you can download it, you can modify it as you see fit. And, uh, and yeah, and basically, uh, you know, use this type of education and teach the people around you, again, to hopefully empower the people that are in your area to do whatever the hell it is that they wanna do. Again, I figure uh, folks in Mogadishu probably have different, uh, different aspirations, different needs and, and hopes and all that than somebody in Atlanta, Georgia versus somebody in Amsterdam, right? So again, you modifying the education for your particular environment. So, as always, I enjoyed uh, teaching this particular seminar. I much preferred teaching this particular seminar to a group of live human beings. But I'll take the virtual people, too. I'll take the virtual people, too. <laughs> uh, if you're wondering what's going to be going on in the future, we are actually going to be starting to focus more on hands-on classes. We're still going to do these seminars, uh, but there's going to be more uh, exercises Again, you can kind of figure out how you're going to do the exercise. I'll give you the code and everything, but again, it's not going to be quite a seminar. The idea is that you're actually going to do some hands-on stuff. I've just noticed that when I do these seminars, especially after a long day, I have a lot of students falling asleep. And let's be honest, I can't really blame them. <laughs> You've had a long day of work. You come to, come to Silicon Dojo at 6 o'clock at night. You sit in a nice comfy chair and listen to me talk for an hour and a half it's not a shocker that you're gonna to go to sleep. So what I wanna do is I wanna do more hands-on classes. So we've done uh, three eight-hour hands-on classes up until this point. Uh, we did PHP, we did MySQL, we did Linux. And my thought is, is, can we cut those down even more into one to three-hour blocks? Again, so the Python that I showed you today, 
Right? That, was, that probably looked pretty simple. Even if you don't know any Python at all, you probably looked at that and went, oh, I could probably do that if I understood what the hell he was doing. So one of my thoughts is, let's do an introduction to Python class, max it at three hours, max it at three hours, and basically explain modules, explain variables, explain if-else statements, explain loops, explain a few other things, just for that basic concept so that then the next class we can do, we could do a, a class on ChatGPT or Dolly, and instead of me sitting up here pontificating at my students, they can actually be sitting there, they can pl be playing with the projects, seeing what happens, and that type of deal. Give them the actual hands-on, uh, you know, the tactile experience of building something uh, to make them feel more comfortable and hopefully, you know, keep them awake, that type of deal. Uh, so this is kind of the model that we're gonna be working towards, and my idea with this, is if we start modulizing and creating blocks of education, then we can just simply pick and choose the blocks for the particular students that are in class or whatever we're trying to solve for. Again, uh, Python is going to be our kind of like our de facto language here just because it does so much. It builds robots, it deals with AI, deals with computer vision, right? And so one of my thoughts is, what if we created like 50 classes, 50 blocks of classes on Python? Some of them will be on databases, some of them will be on ChatGPT, some of them will be on OpenCV, some of them will be on Azure Cognitive Services. And then like every Tuesday or on weeknights, we could just have a one block class. Uh, on a weekend for a day, I could simply stitch two or three or four classes together to come up with a full day class. So it's like, okay, we're gonna teach you Python, Python with ChatGPT, and then that would be a full day. Or we could, we could uh, you know, stitch everything together for a full boot camp. So somebody could come here for, for five days and we could go in and we could have the basics of uh, Python, the basics of Django, the basics of databases, and then connect that with something that they would be interested in, you know, machine vision or whatever else. And that way we can just kind of pick and choose. Again, with business, business is very much about finding a product and finding a replicatable product. Um, and I think coming up with these blocks of classes, hands-on classes, uh, will be a good way to go. Will it? I don't know. I'll tell you in a couple months. <laughs> will it work out? Will it be successful? I will tell you just as soon as I know. So anyways, as said, I always enjoy, uh, enjoy trying, to, trying to teach you folks, trying to, trying to empower you folks to make the world a little bit better place. I look forward to hopefully seeing you at an in-person class. And if nothing else, you can, you can come here and watch me on YouTube. See y'all later.